Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back to this second lecture of week two of NanoHub U's course, An Introduction to Bioelectricity. In this second week, we're talking about the chemical basis of the electrical signals that we were discussing towards the end of that first week. And in today's second lecture, we're going to talk about time and space in propagating signals. So we talked about passive conduction. We talked about active conduction briefly in earlier lectures. But in this lecture, I want to go into a little bit more detail about exactly how passive conduction works, how we can measure it, and what sorts of things we can infer about the anatomy of the neuron and how electrical signaling works in neurons from measurements of uh, passive conducting signals. And then we're going to do the same thing with active conducting signals and compare the two. And this will give us some, some very nice insights into the way that uh, signaling works in the nervous system, both between the dendrite and the cell body, soma, and between the soma and down the axon to the terminal, and then between uh, terminals or between axon and, and dendrite at the synapse. That we'll begin to explore in following lectures. So let's jump right in to revisit passive conduction. So let's say that you had an axon. So a cylindrical tube of an axon uh, of a particular length. And you wanted to electrically stimulate along a point on that length. So we put an extracellular electrode adjacent to but not touching the axon. And we drive a small current into the axon. And so when we drive that current, what we do is we uh, depolarize the neuron and or hyperpolarize the neuron, either way. It, in passive conduction, it makes no difference. Um, so you depolarize or you hyperpolarize, you create a postsynaptic potential, excitatory, inhibitory, it doesn't matter. Um, and so you can measure that. So if you have a series of extracellular recording electrodes, even better actually if they're intracellular patch clamp electrodes, then you can record the electrical potential inside the cell at various different points. And if you record the electrical potential right at the same point along the x-axis, the length of the axon, where you stimulate, you're going to see a particular amplitude. And you're going to see a particular waveform shape. And the shape is very, very important. And we'll come back to that again and again over the course of the next few weeks. Today we'll talk mostly, but not exclusively, about amplitude, but never discount the importance of the shape. Um, the fact that you're stimulating with a square wave and that what you're recording exhibits this ramping behavior tells us a lot about the neuron, its equivalent circuits, and their response. So we have a particular amplitude, looking at just at the amplitude for now, and we notice that if we go some distance to either left or right of that initial point where we're stimulating, that amplitude decreases by some amount. And that's because you have some leakage. You have some current that uh, leaks out of the axon as it travels in either direction. And so the voltage at any given point is going to be smaller than it is right at the origin of the stimulus. And as you move away, that attenuation gets progressively greater and greater. So the signal becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And in fact, you can plot the maximum amplitude as a function of distance along the axon, measured here in millimeters, and you can see that you have the highest value right at the side of the stimulus, and then it falls off exponentially going in either direction. We'll come back to that ex exponential relationship in just a minute. But first, let's look at it a different way. So you have this stimulus pulse, and if you stimulate, you start your stimulus at time t equals zero, you go up to a value of one nanoampere, you maintain that constant current, and then you shut off a little after 30 milliseconds, and you measure the amplitude of the membrane voltage in millivolts. So you're stimulating with a constant current of one nanoampere, and you're measuring the membrane voltage in millivolts. And what you find is that the membrane begins to charge up. Right, So this is what that curve means, and this is why we say charge. So if this membrane was purely resistive, you'd find the voltage would just go up. And it would look just like the current waveform, because the current and the voltage would be related to one another by R. So V equals IR, so the ratio of voltage to current would be R. 
and that would give you a linear following. So the shape would not change. But in fact, what you observe, right, this is not what we would expect, but this necessarily, but this is what we observe, is this ramping behavior. And when we look at other sorts of electronic or electrical circuit components, and ask ourselves which components behave in this fashion, the answer is capacitors. So capacitors charge. And if you apply an instantaneous um, current to a capacitor, you're not going to get an instantaneous change in voltage. You're going to get a ramping voltage. As the capacitor builds up the charge from the current, the current is in coulombs per second over time. You multiply the current times the time, you get the number of coulombs of charge. That'll give you the voltage. So over time, the capacitor will charge up to some value, and then it'll begin to discharge from that value when the current ends. So you see this charging behavior, and you see that the distance, distance of zero millimeters, half a millimeter, one millimeter, the distance from the origin of that stimulus determines what the maximum potential you're going to get is going to be. Okay, so that's one thing that we get out of this, is the fact that we infer from this that there's a capacitor in the membrane. And we'll come back to this way of deducing the the equivalent circuits for membranes when we talk about the cable model and the Hodgkin-Huxley model in weeks three and four of this course. But for now, another thing I want you to take home with you is the fact of the onset. So right at time t equals zero, the current begins and the uh, membrane begins to charge at that point. But at a distance away from that, as you move further and further away, there's a time delay before the current begins to charge. And that's because it takes a small but finite amount of time for the signal to arrive at that point. So keep that in mind as we talk about time delays and as we talk about um, conduction velocities. Okay, so this attenuation that I said was exponential, right? So at the origin, at the side of the stimulus, you're going to have some peak amplitude. We're going to normalize it. So we're going to divide whatever amplitude we have anywhere else by the peak amplitude. So at the peak, you'll have one and it'll drop off from there. At some point, you will have a value of 1 over E. And at 1 over E, you have 30% of your maximal amplitude. And so between those two, you can determine what we call the space constant, lambda. Lambda is equal to the square root of the resistance of the membrane divided by the sum of the resistance of the liquid inside and outside the cell. So the extracellular and intracellular cytoplasm has an impedance, RO and RI. The sum of those two is what we divide the square root of the membrane resistance by to get this lambda, this space constant. So as we increase the membrane resistance, you're going to have less leakage of current. And so you would expect that the signal would attenuate more slowly and your space constant would be greater. And in fact, that's exactly what the equation would give you. If you decrease the membrane resistance, you would expect that the signal would leak out more quickly. Think of it like a hose filled with water. And if you poke holes in it, where these holes represent ion channels that are not fully closed, and you poke these holes in the membrane, you're going to have some amount of leakage. The more holes you have, the lower the membrane impedance is, the more leakage of water you're going to have, and the more your signal is going to die off. Or as you go down the hose. Uh, the less hose you have, the higher the membrane impedance, the less your signal is going to die off. And so that's what we observe here. And this, mem this uh, space constant, which tells us the distance until we've dropped off by 1 over E, is proportional to the memory resistance in just that way. So it makes sense intuitively. And remember from uh, lecture 1.5 that we talked about, when we look at these equations, it's very important, rather than memorizing them, to walk yourself through it and convince yourself that, in fact, it makes sense that the values be what they are. Just like we have a space constant, we have a time constant. So the membrane charges up at a particular speed. It doesn't do so instantaneously, but it does so exponentially, and that's because it is a capacitor. And so if we look at it charging up to 1 over E of the maximum value, so the maximum value minus 1 over E of the maximum, um, or 63%, you can measure that space constant and find that it is proportional to the membrane resistance multiplied by the capacitance. Which means that the larger the capacitance of the membrane, the longer it would take to fill up. So think of it as a capacitor, as a bucket um, that holds water. Right? So just like a, a membrane resistance is the water in a pipe with the leaks, um, the capacitor is the bucket at the end of the hose that carries the water, that holds the charge in an electrical system. So the bigger the bucket, 
the longer it takes to fill. The longer it takes to fill, the slower you'd expect this curve to be, and the greater you'd expect the time constant to be. So it makes sense that the capacitance be directly proportional to the time constant. The same thing with the impedance. The greater the membrane impedance, the greater you would, the longer you would expect it to take to charge up to a particular value. So this equation makes sense intuitively, and this describes the behavior we observe in the way these active or passive signals flow. Let's talk now a little bit about active conduction. So active conduction is different from passive conduction. And here's why. In an active conduction, we take a segment of the axon, and now it's important to draw in the ion channels because the ion channels are what open and close to generate the action potential, and that's how we get that active signal, right? So we draw in the ion channels and we say, okay, we're going to stimulate at this point right here. And so when we stimulate, we're going to depolarize the cell past the threshold, when you hit that threshold, the sodium ion channels are going to open and the potassium ion channels are going to close. When that happens, the cell will depolarize all the way up to the resting membrane potential, not quite, of sodium. And it's not quite the resting membrane potential of sodium because the potassium ion channels reopen before the sodium ion channels close completely. So you never quite get to the resting membrane potential of sodium. But you get to that high voltage of about 20 millivolts and then you begin to roll off again. So now you have a passive signal or a passive postsynaptic potential here, except it's not postsynaptic, it's post-stimulus, but you have an intracellular signal that flows passively and begins to charge the membrane at various different points, right? The last place physically where it can charge the membrane to the threshold will be the place where the next action potential begins. So it'll flow all the way down to here, and here it still has enough voltage to charge the membrane up to the threshold voltage, and you'll have the sodium ion channels open, the potassium ion channels close, and you'll generate a new action potential. In between, you're going to get generate a lot of action potentials as well. But that's a waste of energy, and it doesn't really matter because the process of generating a new action potential is slow. And so passive conduction will be faster than the process of generating a new action potential. Um, so it doesn't matter which action potentials are being generated along here, between this point and here. What matters is which one is the furthest one over to the right, because that's the one that's then going to be propagating down. Okay? So this action potential will, will, will activate. It'll begin to propagate down. And at some distance, it'll repeat the same process. And so at each point, as you go down the membrane, you'll be regenerating the action potential. You're not regenerating the original depolarizing shift of the stimulus. The stimulus gives you an action potential. Those are all or nothing. So it's a binary one or a zero, remember from the first lecture, and that is what you're regenerating. So if you were to place the same set of recording electrodes outside of the cell as we did for the passive case, you'd record an action potential at each and every one of these and that action potential would be exactly the same amplitude as the original action potential. So this is the difference between active versus passive flow. In the passive flow case, if you go far enough down the axon, you're not going to see a signal at all. In the active case, you can go as far as you want because the signal is constantly regenerating. So if you think about how a signal travels from a dendrite to the soma, those two are very close together physically, so you can get that signal from A to B passively. But then think about that soma, that cell body in the brain, in the primary motor cortex, innervating a muscle, a muscle in your leg. And to get that distance, more than a meter, um, to the spinal cord where it synapses, or further, especially in the case of the sensory uh, neurons and the dorsal root ganglia, you have to have a means of regenerating that signal, just like we talked about with cell phone towers, where they receive your signal, they amplify it and retransmit it without changing it. That's what we're doing here. We're receiving the signal, amplifying it, and retransmitting it down the line. And if we look at point A, B, and C, we see that the amplitude remains constant. The only thing that changes is the amount of time that it takes to get 
to those various points. So there's a time delay because those signals do not travel infinitely quickly. They travel at some velocity. And that conduction velocity is a function of the speed with which the passive current flows down the axon to initiate that new action potential and also the speed with which you regenerate that action potential, the speed with which you open and close those ion channels, depolarize that cell, and regenerate that signal. And that brings us to how we accelerate the conduction. So how do you go about making conduction faster? And, and why do you care? So we talked in the very first lecture, we talked about the diversity of neurons, and we also talked about glial cells, these support cells. And I mentioned in particular one of them, the oleodendrocytes, and I said we'd come back to oleodendrocytes. And the reason is because oleodendrocytes do something called myelination. And myelination is this wrapping in these sheaths, it's like an onion when you take a cross section, it's wrapping the neuron in these layers of fat. And the fat explains why uh, the axons, which are the only part of the cell that gets myelinated, the axons look white in a cross-section. And when you look at a cross-section of the brain, you see the white matter and the gray matter. The white matter, remember, it represents these myelinated fibers. So these myelinated axons, um, are, are this myelination happens because of these oleodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Peripheral neurons are also myelinated, but they're myelinated by what are called Schwann cells. So this myelination happens, and you have between um, or every so often, you have what's called a node of Ranvier. And a node of Ranvier is a segment of axon which is not myelinated. So if you look at a whole axon, you've got little gaps every so often. And the reason why we do this is so that we can have what's called saltatory conduction. So saltatory conduction is the observation that if you initiate an action potential at one point, the furthest point at which you can regenerate that action potential is going to regenerate that action potential, and that's the signal that's going to continue to travel down, then why regenerate action potentials all along the way? It's just a waste. So if you myelinate it, you seal off all the potassium and sodium ion channels along the way, and the action potential can't be regenerated in that space, and so you save energy. Now that's one reason, but that's not the most important reason. The most important reason is that by sealing this off, you increase the membrane resistance. You're effectively insulating the wire. And when you increase the membrane resistance, what happens is that the space constant, which is proportional to the square root of Rm, goes up, which means that the signal will travel further without attenuating. And recall that we said that passive conduction is faster than this process of regenerating an action potential. So if we can make the signal travel further, faster, and regenerate it only when we need to, then the net effect is going to be faster propagation of signals, perhaps faster nerve conduction. So if you have a signal beginning here, it travels down to this space between two sections of myelinated sheath, and that space, recall, is called the node of Ranvier. At the node, it regenerates, and then it flows down the myelinated segment, to the next node, and at the next node, it regenerates again. And so this process of saltatory, from the Latin word for jumping, jumping conduction, because the action potential jumps from node to node, is the fastest way of carrying a signal down an axon. And speed matters, because speed is what allows your reflexes to be quick. And the difference between survival and the opposite, the alternative, is speed, often, in reflexes, especially when you think from an evolutionary perspective. So it's very important to develop this mechanism. Now, what happens in situations in which the myelin, for example, is compromised? Uh, so the myelin is compromised in, for example, multiple sclerosis. That's a demyelinating disease. When the myelin is compromised in multiple sclerosis, what happens is that, in some cases, the action potentials don't float. They don't reach this node before they've attenuated because the impedance of the myelin sheath has dropped. And in some cases, they just flow passively all the way down the line. Either way, you have a signal that either doesn't reach its terminal or reaches it out of sync with the other fibers in a nerve. So a single nerve is not a single axon. A single nerve is a bundle of thousands of million, millions of axons. And if the signals arrive out of joint, then you won't necessarily get the effect that you're looking for. And so you have this progressive loss, especially in the periphery initially, of motor control.
Um, so that's um, what you see in multiple sclerosis. Okay, so let's do a comparison. So if we do a comparison of active versus saltatory conduction. We see that an action potential that begins in both places will flow passively in both, but faster where there's myelin. And so by the time you've reached this point on a non-myelinated axon, you will have reached this one on a myelinated axon. And by the time you've reached here on a non-myelinated axon, you've reached here. So you travel almost twice as fast in this example as you do in the case of the unmyelinated axons. So myelin is very, very important because it optimizes conduction velocity by combining the best of passive conduction, which is speed, with the best of active conduction, which is the ability to maintain your initial signal integrity over a long length of axon. And that's where we'll leave it today. We'll start, we'll come back in the next lecture and begin talking about the applications of what we've learned in this lecture. Thank you very much.